Hey guys, this is Steli Efti with Close.io. Uh, today I have a super cool dude with me. I'm really pumped. Uh, we've been friends and known each other for, really, uh, for a while now. I don't know, for a few years, it feels like. Um, and I really wanted to do this, this call with him and kind of tap into his sales, uh, sales leader brain and, and bring out some really good shit for you guys. Uh, my friend, you know, the one and only SMB New York sales hustler, Dave Greenberger. How's it going, my man? Good, man. Thanks. So I'm going to let you talk a little bit about, about your background, but I want to share uh, I want to share with the audience here why I wanted to talk to you. So th there's multiple reasons. Number one, you're a cool dude. Number two, um, you have a ton of experience in a, in a segment that I see more and more people in startups needing help with, and that's specifically doing startup sales for SMBs. Right and really going and acquiring uh, small, medium-sized businesses, acquiring local businesses for software and tech products. And you have a, a, you know have a ton of experience in this through multiple businesses and through like being a junior guy and growing to a sales leader in an organization all the way to now being one of the sales leaders at Foursquare, helping them really try out cool new shit and 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 really push the boundaries of what can be done in SMB and local sales. So uh, tell us a little bit about how the fuck did you get into sales and startups? Uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, tell people some of your, your background and then we'll jump into some really actionable advice that I think that people are going to get a lot out of. Yeah, uh, sure. Thanks. Nice words. <laughs> I mean <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, so I, the, the way I got started is pretty dumb, actually. Uh, I wanted to, I always wanted to like run my own business and do my own thing and be in control. So um, I ended up talking to these guys, they were about 15 people, uh, they, they had a startup and uh, I interviewed with them, they were great, they loved me, I loved them and I said the only thing is uh, I don't really want to do sales, so uh, whatever else and they said oh yeah well you know we'll get the right people on the bus. Um, ended up getting in there day one and I'm one of their first sales guys uh, <laughs> and it was crazy I couldn't do it I'm trying to like sign up we were selling leads to gym to gym owners uh, and it was like a cold call you know 10 minutes after you get them on the phone you got to get their credit card uh, at the time my dad probably wouldn't even use his credit card at Subway because he thought he was gonna get like his whole bank account taken um, so it was tough for me and I just kept hacking away at it started figuring it out um, this is what became Yext. Um, really, really quickly, you know, it's the type of sale we were making 150 calls a day. You get like eight owners on the phone and uh, you're trying to close three of them, right? And we didn't know any better and that's what we did. Um, and it turned into this really crazy thing. I started to crack it. I figured it out, luckily. Um, and then I just had the lucky opportunity to work with these guys um, all the way up as they grew a team. Uh, I became their first sales manager, and real quickly, within like a year and a half, uh, we were almost at about 100 salespeople uh, that I, I was managing through. So it was one of the craziest rides ever. Um, and, you know, we, we learned a ton. We, those 100 people were all making like 150 calls a day. It was like, you know, we had the boiler room type environment. They're throwing Nerf balls everywhere. We're blasting music, selling under the desk. Um, <laughs> So it was a really fun time, and we just tried and tested everything. Um, then I got to do it again with a spin out for the one of the ex co founders called Felix that we sold within sixteen months. Uh, and then I got the awesome opportunity to come to Foursquare and try and do it again. That's awesome. So wh wh where was all this? Is, uh, has all this happened kind of in the New York area, or was this somewhere totally different? Yeah, this is New York City. Uh, New York City. We started at Yext. It was like in this little dance studio in Columbus Circle. Uh, and yeah, everyone was like, why the hell are you starting a company in New York? You know, it's so much cheaper in Pittsburgh or something like that. And, um, you know, now there's this huge Silicon Alley has grown around it. So I guess they knew something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's great shit. All right. So I could just, just with that intro, I could spend the next 60 minutes just digging into these stories. But I'll, <laughs> I just have one question. And then yeah. I really just want to, the, the things we want to talk about it are going to be really focused on like, how do you figure out SMB sales and local sales for startups? And how do you build a team around that? Because uh, I think those are the things that I at least see every day people struggling with. Um, but one question that I have on a personal level is, you said, you know, you didn't want to be in sales, right? Which I think 
many of us can identify with. I don't think a lot of people grew up going, I want to be a salesperson when I, <laughs> when I grow up, right? It's not yeah, like stealing the words right from my mouth. I tell my guys that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Right. But but and then and then these guys tricked you into sales, right? You're like, I'm gonna do anything and everything you want, just <laughs> accept sales and like cool story, bro. Just join us. And the next day you're like the first salesperson. So yeah. and you you're telling us again, I, I think a pretty typical story of like you struggling at first and then kind of figuring it out. The one thing that I'm interested in is why didn't you just quit? Like you joined, you were like baited and switched into this position. Why didn't you just go, fuck this, I'm going to do something else. Or when it became really hard, why didn't you just quit? Like what made you stick around and, and figure it out? Dude, good question. So this is really interesting. You know, I, uh, I am from Pittsburgh originally. I'm not from New York. Okay. So when I took this job, I took it. I had five days to find an apartment. I found this apartment in Chinatown. It was like thousand bucks a month living with like 10 Europeans in this little Chinatown apartment. And, um, you know, I, I, the, the real thing, I wanted to quit every day. And the, and the real thing was, was like, hey, I want to figure this out. You know, I have, for the first time ever, I have rent. I ha I'm living in New York. Like, I, I'm going to make this happen. Um, and, you know, I would, I, would literally, I would go into Central Park every day and I'd be like, all right, not going to quit, not going to quit. Like, I could be like digging ditches somewhere like this is all right and um, it was tough and actually the thing that made me that made it click for me was I just stopped caring I was like all right I'm gonna give this my best effort I'm gonna try as best as I can leave it all on the field doesn't work out whatever right and if it and if it does I'll, I'll find something else to do if it doesn't and when I started to do that and relax, I started to, to have a little bit more fun with people. I didn't care so much about the call. I wasn't so desperate. Suddenly it started to come through. And then it's like, hey, this is kind of fun when you start figuring it out. Uh, <laughs> Yes, I don't really know the answer, I guess. No, but. I, I, but, but I think there's a, a, a lot of what you're saying is just resonating really strongly with me. And I have to assume with lots of other people in, in that, you know, at the beginning it's hard, but there was a reason why you stuck with it. And in, in your case, it might have been like, this is New York, this is my first gig. I don't want to quit, right? I want to figure it out. And then also just going like, Hey, it could be worse. There's a million other things I could be doing. Let's not take this too serious. Let's just have fun with it. And I'll give my all. And if it doesn't work out, at least I know I, I did everything I could. And then I'll just do something else. And like that, that moment where you both commit but you relax kind of uh, makes a big difference in sales. Because it comes through when you talk to people. You know, what your energy level is, what your approach is. If you're in your head criticizing yourself. If you're like yeah. in pain and in doubt. Or if you're just having fun and you're like, I'm committed to this. I'm doing this shit one way or another. I'm going to call the – I'm going to make these 150 calls day in, day out, whatever. And, and then just that translates into that confidence, that the comfort that makes other people comfortable and, and confident in you. 100%. You're having fun. They're having fun. Yeah, right? exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So let's let's make a few jumps and really talk about the, the area of SMB and local sales for startups. So – you know, I talked to tons of people. I was talking to somebody this morning that I was referring to you, and I'm going to send you an intro to him, and I'm going to introduce you to you guys. I talk to people every day that are like SMB, sales, local sales, startup, trying to figure it out, trying to build the team, hiring the first few people, struggling, right? Tons of questions. Yeah. How do we create the commission structure? Where do I find people to hire? How do I train and coach them? What should be the benchmarks I set for them? There's a million questions. How do we do SMB and local sales? So I want to just tap into your experience because I don't think there are that many people that have SMB and local startup sales experience and, and share some of that knowledge. And you said that with Yext, you guys were just like trying anything and everything yeah. but you, at the same time, scaling to a hundred salespeople really quickly. Tell me, let's first focus on some of the mistakes and things that people could avoid, right? Uh, tell me some of the things that today, as you give advice to lots of people, you see people making uh, mistakes, going about it the wrong way or thinking about it the wrong way or things that people should just avoid to save themselves a lot of trouble uh, and, and, and time. Like what are some of the biggest mistakes people do in SMB and local sales? Yeah, I, I think actually the biggest mistake, uh, this is going to sound really weird, is overthinking it. Um, it, it's really tough, you know, uh, just, just on a really raw level, if you have someone uh, that's getting on the phones for the first time and they're having to talk to a plumber or a restaurant owner or something like that, uh, you can have the most like personable, fun guy in the world, really creative, and as soon as they pick up that phone and someone's on the other end of the line, 
they're they're like you know mr stiff they basically have a suit and tie on and uh hello mister i'd like to talk to you about foursquare today right and and that's actually kind of the the whole problem no one wants to talk to a guy like that no one wants to talk to salespeople, and so that's the thing that I, I i think happens a lot and that we figured out really early at yex is the more on your level or on the customer's level you can be the better and so what i mean by that is don't send an email that's you know uh, five paragraphs long that tells we've worked with four customers and all the benefits that's going on. Send them an email real quick, like, "Hey, I have some customers uh, that that we were hoping to possibly send over to you. Uh, do you have any availabilities today?" Right, and just get that conversation going, and that's what we we see hits. When you're talking on the phone, don't just don't get the ma'ams and sirs, and I'd love to talk to you about the solutions and optimization that Foursquare has. Just tell them about like. Hey, I had a quick moment. I thought this might be able to to, to help you. Uh, give me two seconds, right? And and that really helps. And so you know, all along the way, if you can just kind of like stop overthinking things. And one of my one of my mentors told me real early on, like, don't figure it out, find out, right? Mm -hmm. Just get, get out there, get the data out there, try a bunch of things, see what sticks, and then double down into that and keep doing that over and over. And I don't know. That's how we figured it out because there wasn't a model uh, early, early on at Yex. Um, the other thing that I, that I would say that's so important is you have to know that this job is really hard and there's no way around it. There's all these like sales optimization tools and everything today uh, and you hear all these things like cold calling is dead and whatnot and you know that stuff's actually kind of true. I'm working on some more enter enterprise sale sales now and yeah a lot of these things are working really well but when you get to like the owner of a bar and he's got three bars um, you're not getting a hold of that guy, okay? You're just not, and you've got a call, and it's not going to work on the first call. You're going to get the bartender, and the second call, you're going to get the janitor, and the third call, you're going to get that bartender again, and you've got to keep going, and then eventually, you're going to get him, and when you get him, you've got to be ready and be ready to close him, like, right then and there. So you can't, you can't try and, like, there's no tricks. It actually takes a, a lot of hard work, and you've got to be ready to do that, I think. Yeah, I, first of all, the most the, the first tweetable moment of this uh, was the you can't figure don't try to figure it out, find out, right? That's such a beautiful quote. Um, I think also, you know, when you when you say, you know, the, one of the problem is like overthinking it. Tr also, the way that I would describe it is trying to sound like a salesperson. For some weird reason, we all don't like the typical the stereotypical salesperson but when we do sales we think we have to sound like that and we're like this weird persona that's like hello mr but it's totally fake so it's bad like, so bad it's like nobody speaks like that same thing with emails a lot of times i send emails back to people when they ask me for feedback and i ask them would you ever send this to your brother or your sister or some or a friend like this email reads like a generic marketing email that fucking Coca-Cola would send to 10 million people. No human being writes like this. Yeah. You know, the subject line is the 10 benefits our business is going to bring to your business. All ca like capital first. Like, like who writes? You would never write that to a friend. So just be a normal human being. Speak comfortably. So I think, I think you actually uh, uh, wrote this somewhere, and it's something that we used to do all the time. We, we would always do uh, the phone test, right? Any kind of email we're sending, we're looking at our phone, and we're reading it, and does it fit in that first line under, under the scroll? And what we used to try that worked really well is we would fuck with all the subject lines. Like We would misspell things on purpose a little bit. We would like capitalize the wrong thing, and then we would send that out as a blast to 100 people. I shouldn't be probably like giving away the secret, but uh, it... But, but that, we would get such better responses to that because you're a real person. Like, this is how a plumber talks. This is how a bar owner talks. And it's on his level. And he could just respond back. And they would just respond back like, yes, no, shut up, whatever. But at least you're getting a response, right? And it was really, really good. Yeah, I think, yeah. That, I think that the misspelling thing is like one tactic that just makes you seem like a real human being. Uh, there were other black hat tactics of like having in the footer like send via iPhone or something like that, which we tested. <laughs> Just response rates go up. Um, I think the, even the funny thing is no, whenever, it's, whenever an email feels like it was not sent to me personally by another human being, but it was, it's part of like a one-to-many thing or it's automated, response rates will go down because I don't want to talk to a machine and I don't care and I don't feel the responsibility of speaking back to you because there's nobody to speak back to right even in team situations we found this out a long time ago whenever I would send an email with a call to action and it would be like a team at 
Close out, like, hey, to all of you 10 people, I need you to reply and tell me this. Nobody would ever <laughs> reply. Because <laughs> everybody waited for the rest of the people to reply. Yeah. Versus you do the same thing, you send it one by one, and just every single person replies because you feel that, oh, somebody's a, a human being is talking to me. So the least I can do is talk back and go, no, no interest, or I can't do it. I'll say something back, right? If I truly feel that there's a, a caring, normal human being that's speaking to me. Um, that's it. And you just automatically think they're not, right? And, and just one more thing. So I'm, I'm digging real deep into the sales stack right now. Yeah. So I spent this last week, like I'm demoing all these products. And I'm sitting on these demos and they're all like, ah, just get me off the phone. The, the product could be great, but I, but I can't handle it. And I get on the phone with this guy from Sales Loft yesterday. And uh, he, he makes me do this video thing. I didn't know I was going to be in video. Suddenly I show up and he's just sitting there laid back and he's got this big jar full of nuts that he's eating. He's like, hey, Dave, I'm eating nuts. I hope that's all right right now. And he's like showing me the office and stuff. And boy, did I listen to that conversation so much more than anyone else because he was a person. Like, and it didn't matter that it was video. It was that he was relaxed. He wasn't jumping down my throat. He didn't have an agenda or a script really to go through or I didn't feel like it. And it, you know, it, that matters all the way through. Yeah, shout out to uh, to uh, the sales loft team. Those guys are doing some some awesome shit, uh, and they know they know what they're doing. They're really building an amazing culture on the sales side of things. Uh, so, let's talk about the the. Okay, so let's not overthink it. Let's talk about the second thing that you said, which was the. It's gonna be hard, right? Yeah. I mean, you can optimize. You can hack. You can figure things out. Some things, obviously, over years, you built the 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 muscle. And it, you know, and what what feels like a marathon to a newbie is like a little sprint to you, right? So over time, obviously, things get easier, but it's never easy. Like the fundamentals are still hard. You have to hustle. You have to grind. You have to care. You have to bring it every single in every single interaction, every single day. There's no shortcuts to that. There's no shortcuts to like showing up every day and being consistent and overcoming your own fears. Or even when you have just a bad day where you had a huge argument with somebody that's close to you and you just don't feel like being like on the phone, hustling, selling. Well, you have to find a way to get over yourself. And, and these things are hard. There's no shortcuts here. And no matter how much technology is out there and no matter how many methodologies, no matter how many videos like this are out there to help teach people things, you just have to learn that. I, I, I find it uh, liberating to understand that this is going to be hard. The cool thing is that I know that most people don't want to put in the work. So if you do, you're going to win. Right, that's really it. But there's no magical hack that's gonna just beautifully and easily always fix the sales problem, or sales challenge for you. So let's let's uh, think about the 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 first few steps. Let's say you're starting a new business and you want to sell to SMB or to local businesses. What's the first few things that you would do? Like, what's your game plan? What's your roadmap? What's your template to even get started to figure things out? Not not figure things out, find things out, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I got like a we got a fire drill going on here. I think so. If anything nice. goes crazy, uh, don't, don't worry about it. Every, All right. Just the drill. All right. Um, yeah. So so I actually just gave a gave a talk about this fresh in my head. So you know, if if, if I'm a founder, I, I think the thing that's really really important. You just said it right. The the work is really really hard. And the important thing that I think uh, I, I was lucky to be a part of really early is we made it fun. Doing 150 cold calls a, a day and talking to receptionists and like bartenders and telling you no is the most miserable thing you could possibly do. And if you are doing this in a uh, cubicle with a bunch of other, you know, like 50 year old guys with a with a suit and tie everywhere, just like you know, uh, that's going to be really, really tough, and you're not going to be able to do it. There's no way. But what we did is we had a culture of just like really, really like tough competition. Like this is a culture of the guy next to me, we're betting on literally everything that goes, we're betting on how many donuts you could eat in the morning. We're betting that you can't do this and that. Uh, I'm, make, I'm doing everything I can to jump above them. We've got scoreboards everywhere in the office. Um, my manager did a really good job just to coax us into thing. Like, you know, you're, you're the top two on the scoreboard. We're going out for ice cream. You're the top, you know, 10%. You made your sales today. We're going to go for a drink, you know, whatever it is. And it was really little stuff that didn't take a whole lot of, uh, money or resources, but really, really, really made it fun and like competitive to go to work. And then if you're doing that 
and you're having fun with what you're doing, well, then it's a little bit easier to, to make all those calls because you're not caring so much. You're caring more about the process. You're caring more about if you can keep your hand on the monitor for an hour that the contest that's going on, <laughs> or if you can drop in Rick Ross in the conversation, then necessarily you are about just like getting pounded and hearing no, 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 no. And then as you said at the beginning, if you're having fun, other guys having fun. Right, and and that's kind of where it comes from. So I think really the if if you're going to get into SMV sales and know that it's a really hard thing to do and it's an expensive thing to do, the first thing you should invest in is making sure you're setting up the right culture for your team. Right, and then if you can do that and you have the right culture, and then on the other side, these guys that are coming in believe in you and your product. Right, so like if you're the founder, you've got to be involved in that process. You've got to be talking to these young kids that are on the phone. You've got to be doing all all, all these things, and if they believe that and they're having fun at what they're doing, they'll run through walls, right? And eventually, you know, I've had kids that made 300 calls in a day. Like, that's crazy. I don't even know how it works. How do you make 300 calls in a day? And it probably means something's wrong, but they're willing to do that. And right, and once you, if you can make that many calls and you're not making sales, well, then something's wrong with the sales process and you can go read Steli's book and figure out like what to do and, and, and how to fix that, right? But you've got to get them to do the work first. So let's talk about the culture because I think that's super fascinating. And that's, that's something that I don't think is talked about enough. Like how do you build the right culture for your sales team to begin with? One of the first things that I picked up that I was super surprised when I visited you guys last time at the Foursquare offices in New York was mm -hmm. that I walked through this really cool office. And it's kind of a typical startup office, lots of like just cool design and lots of people on their monitors doing things. It's not super quiet, but it's not super loud. And then I turned the corner and I approached your team and there's fucking music playing. Right. And it's like loud and it's buzzing and there's an energy about it. And the music thing really stood up because honestly, to you, it might be normal. But I never saw I've never seen a, another sales team other than yours. And I've visited tons of them that have music playing right? <laughs> while they're on the call, while they're sending emails, there's fucking music in the background. So t tell me a little bit about the music. Tell me a little bit about the context and fun. But also just like if somebody's if somebody's inspired by what you say, what are some things that people can do? to create the right culture? What are some of the fun things that are easy to do and that you are utilizing and using when you build your sales teams? Yeah, uh, everyone always asks me about the music. Don't, don't, don't like the customers get upset about that. And don't, like, <laughs> no, like you, you hear it at once every like 2,000 calls, someone will say something and you just say, yeah, whatever. You know, we used to have crazy like celebrations going on. Every time someone makes a call, we're, everyone's going nuts. And like some people get weird out and the other people are like, yeah, we just closed Midas or, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. that's great. Um, so the, the, we always play music. I guess one of my first uh, mentors was, I, I'm telling you, I'm really lucky, was a guy who ran the original MTV sales force, right? Oh. And now at this point, he's, he's, uh, he's a good bit older, he's retired and everything. But he came in and he was mentoring us a little bit on, on what makes a good team. And his thing was like, a good sales floor should always be buzzing, always, right? It's just like a party when you're going to a, to a, a party, right? If you're standing outside and you just hear like some people talking and it's a little quiet and you hear like a laugh every once in a while, it's like, oh, all right. But if you come in, you hear like people going nuts and having fun, that's a party you want to be a part of, right? And that's kind of how you should judge a sales board too. So even if it's a little bit of artificial noise, you want to get that, you want to get that buzz going and people feed, you know, salespeople feed off e each other with that energy. So that's always been um, really, really important to me. It's never been a problem. And then again, you know, we're talking about being relaxed. We're talking about being having fun, all that stuff. It's man, is it a lot easier to do that when you're not worried that the guy listen, the guy next to you is listening to what you're saying, or like you have you have something going on, and you can just relax, and you got some Michael Jackson going on in the background, and you start dancing a little bit. You're doing all right. Uh, I don't know. We that's who's, that's who's selecting the playlist? Like, what kind of music is playing? Oh, come on, you are. Yeah, of course you are. So you so you have like a Spotify playlist for for like every day. How do you do it? Like, I let's do get weddings, really practical. Like everyone. <laughs> no, I, I, so we act. What well, we actually, I've done all kinds of things. Uh, Spotify wasn't around when we first started, and I was just DJing it. And then uh, at Felix, I had a pretty big sales for about seventy people, and we had some money at that time, so we had TVs everywhere. And if you remember turntable.fm, I'd use that so anyone could use their own thing. Uh, I've done things where everyone has a sales song. So, like, I got to remember who just made a sale. I play their song. That's, like, pretty cool. People have fun with that. Uh, awesome. at, this, at this point, you know, we're only seven people at, uh, right now on our local team. So it's a little bit lower, a little bit more, more relaxed. 
uh, we just put on like Spotify playlists and just go and everyone has access to the music and you change what you want and it's like, hey, it, it, it where you don't need to be super complicated. You don't need to get like a five thousand uh, dollar stereo system or whatever. Just Bring in a boombox. All right, listen, we're going to write about this, and I'm going to make you share your Spotify sales uh, team uh, playlist with us. Oh, so, get some Spotify followers yeah, out of it. Yeah, yeah, let's, 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 <laughs> let's create some following around this. Um, all right, okay, so music, that's cool. I totally get it, the, the, the buzz, the energy. Also, just having a little bit of back, backdrop noise so people are not, like, weirded out when they're the only ones speaking on the phone. Um what else? Uh, you talked about competitions, like uh, th there's competitions that have to do with the work, like who makes the most calls, who closes the most deals, who's in the top 10% and things like that. But then also just, you said you guys were making bets about everything. Like you have to, who's going to hold his hand on the monitor for an hour or bring in Rick Ross in the conversation or something like that. Um, so that, that so making little bets, uh, making the environment competitive. How do you think about the, being overly competitive, right? There's kind of the, the fine line in the boiler room where it's not like we're all having a great time we want to compete but we're on the same team but it's like doggy dog i want to kill you i want everybody here to fail so i'm the best like how do you balance how do you create that balance which is important for a startup team of like having a competitive fun energetic sales team but not turning it into a hyper competitive and aggressive sales team yeah 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 so that that, that that's uh, i i to be honest, I think a little bit of that dog eat dog is not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. But the important thing, I, I mean, I think I'm, a, I'm an economics major, right? So I think everything's about setting up um, the, the incentives, right? And if you're talking about a startup, any startup, I don't care, even, even with Foursquare, we're, we're, we're a big company at this point. Um, as a salesperson, you're going to be able to make a, a good amount of money uh, but if you're moving up or down the scoreboard, right? You may be able to increase your, sal your salary, maybe a couple thousand dollars even from if you get to the top or, or you get to the bottom. But the way that you're really going to make money, the way that you're really gonna, gonna be good is if the company is successful, right? And that's the only way you're actually, like even if you don't have equity, if you have equity, that's a no brainer. Even if you don't have equity, like the reason I got my job at Foursquare is because Yex took off and people know Yex, right? And so, you are as good as the rocket ship can, can take you, basically. And you've got to understand that. And so when it comes to that, like every month, we have a goal that the, that the company and the sales team needs to make. And if we make that goal, more fun stuff's probably on the way. And we get more resources and we can do more hilarious contests and like crazy things. And if we don't, it's going to be a miserable next month. And like some people might be let go and like some things might happen. And, you know, we're going to have to really tighten up. And that's, that's just, for me, always how, how it works. You know, you have a good month, you're going to have fun the next month. You didn't have a good month as a, as a team, we're going to be in trouble and we're going to have to work our way out of it. So it's always been like the team goals like more important. I think that's how naturally it's always going to be at a startup or should be at least. Yeah. So how do you find salespeople to build your SMB and local team? Usually the, the, the teams that I see that most people build are full of really kind of young, you know, early in their career, young people, a lot of times not with a lot of sales experience, right? You're not going out and hiring like the enterprise sales guy from SAP to work on your local sales team typically. So you, you look for more like inexperienced, raw talent to bring in. How do you think about the type of people you're looking for to hire and who's good in SMB and local sales and where do you source them? Where do you get your talent from? Yeah, that's right. So I definitely prefer to hire an experience. I, I take this line from uh, from my boss, the guy who taught me everything. But he said, I'd, I'd rather um, teach people my bad habits than have to correct someone else's. Right. I think that's totally true. I think there's actually a lot of really shitty salespeople out there. Um, and maybe that's a component of their bosses. Maybe it's a component of bad culture, whatever. I don't care about age at all. Right. Like I'll take anyone uh, as an example. Like so one of my mentors companies, uh, he had people he had like uh, a guy who was a swim coach for 20 years, a guy who was a bus driver at the airport and was an artist and all this stuff, and, and some of these guys that were his best seller. So it doesn't matter about like youth or anything like that, but I do, I do compare or worry about experience. Um, so I, I, like to, I like to get people that don't have a lot of experience in sales, maybe don't have like a limit set in their mind of what they can and can't do, and let me allow them to kind of like set those bars and what's realistic and what's not for them. Um, so yeah, I like to do that. Who do I look for? Uh, someone who's like 
hungry, aggressive, and a, and a team player. If we're hiring out of school, I'm looking for, for you know, someone who's like o- overly social, took on too many activities in, in school, whether it's work or job or whatever. Um, I'm looking for someone that's really smart, but I'm not looking for like straight A's. I, I, I want that person actually that got like a B because they went to office hours every week and like convinced their teacher to get that up from the C minus or like whatever it is, right? Yeah. That's, those are the guys that I kind of want. And the other thing that I do that I think is really important, I mean, especially on my teams, you come into my offices and it's like, oh my God, this is crazy. There's like music playing, this is so much fun. So everyone kind of wants to work there. And I found that it was really important for me in an interview to actually um, almost scare someone out of a job right? Uh, this is going to be the hardest thing you're ever going to do. It's like, and, and this is all true, by the way. I'm not making this up. You know, I, I tell them that, that uh, being on the phone in your first week is going to be like pu- getting punched in the face a hundred times. Like it's really, really tough. And then every single day for the next like year, you need to bring it every day. It's super type A. There's a lot of uh, competition going on. And then I'll even often say like, I don't think you can handle it and just see what happens. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, you know, there's two reactions you get from that. One is like the deer in the headlights, like, oh boy, like, what am I getting into? And the other is like, you start to get like, don't tell me, like, <laughs> don't tell me I can't handle it. Like, I can, like, you know, the, and, and they're going to get excited about it. And, and I don't, you know, I try and do this in subtle ways, you know, not being really aggressive in an interview. Um, but you can really tell a lot from that. And those people that are hungry and that kind of want it and can, handle that objection of you can't do it, hey, they're going to be pretty good on, on the phones as well. Um, and, and so that's, I don't know, it worked out so far. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, a lot of the things that you say, I think we're super aligned on like our philosophy to sales and what type of people are looking for and how we build teams. But what I love is that question. I think that's a super valuable question is to just tell people and challenge them a little bit and go, I don't think you can do it. Like I have, I have doubt in you and see, is that going to make them you know, feel challenged? And is that something that excites them? Will they speak up for themselves and go, no, 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 don't tell me what I can or cannot do? Or will will that like crush them in their confidence? Because if they can't handle that kind of little bit of a challenge, it's going to be really tough to be on the phone and get yelled at or hear no's all day long, right? It's so, so, it's so hard. <laughs> the other, and the other thing that's, that I want to mention there too is that, I mean, I, maybe other people can, but don't expect to be good at hiring if you're hiring uh, inexperienced people. You know, like I, I, I'd hit on like a 60% rate and be, and be thrilled about it. And you, and you kind of need to know that up front. A lot of the things we do is actually hiring on a trial basis also. You know, you have, you have like a training period where you need to make X amount of sales in Y amount of time uh, in order to kind of like make the team. And we're just very, very upfront about that. And you, and you kind of have to be right? Um, you have three months or, or whatever the situation is. And that does a lot of things. It gets people like going right away, like right out of the gate, you've, you've got something going, you've got some competition. But um, also like it allows people, someone who's never done this type of sale before, it's really hard for you to tell them what it's going to be like and suss out, is this going to be good or not? So one, you want to see if they can do it. And two, you want to see if it's right for them. And a lot of times it's just not the right environment for them. And you need to be like, okay with that and allow people to, to kind of let them see themselves out or help them get to that number. And it's real cut or dry. Hey, either we, we can do this or not. And if we can't, I'll do everything I can to help you find uh, a, another job somewhere that really suits you. Yeah, I think that a uh, question that, that I hear a lot is people saying, what are the perfect ways to interview a salesperson and know that you really hired a, a good uh, salesperson? And I always say, I don't think you can. Like, it's like saying, what are all the questions I could ask a basketball player to know if they're going to be amazing in the game? I mean, I'm sure you can ask some questions to figure out who they are as a person, but you need to throw them a ball and you need to see them play in a game against other people. And ideally, you want to see them play for a few games. It's impossible to just intellectually answer some of these questions because sales is a full context sport, right? And and it's also hard for them to know if it's going to be the right environment. So I see this trial period. I see that being a very successful formula. We do this. You guys do this. Lots of people that have or lots of companies that build really successful sales teams don't just hire people. And I always say you can't, you're never going to hear me say the words, I just hired an amazing person in sales. You'll never hear me say that because I don't know. Like I literally, I've no <laughs> I say it all the time, but I'm wrong all the time. <laughs> I mean, that's fine too, right? You're like, this is the greatest. You're, so now right. you're hyping them up and that's cool too. <laughs> 
But I, you know, no matter how much I think I know about sales, I never, I, I, at least I never think I can figure it out in a few interviews or in a few days. I, I always think I need to get to know this person and see, can they bring it every day for a long period of time and also give them the opportunity to really discover that. Now, I wanted to talk to you about this anyway. So this is a great segue, which is the... Oh Right. So we talked a little bit about like the culture, the philosophy, some basic things. And now we started thinking, well, how do you find these people? How do you think about talent? How do you start hiring them? What do you do with them? How do you coach them? How do you get this inexperienced talent to perform? So one thing that you said is that you always do a trial period to give them and, and yourselves a chance to really figure it out. How long is that trial period typically? Yeah, so I'm doing all kinds of different things at, at, at Foursquare, and we're trying some things, and you know, we've got to really like play play the the right card. We it's not just like this dance studio in Columbus Circle where we can try a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um. So 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 we're doing different things. But what uh, would you advise I, somebody to do? Like when you think about a trial period, what do you think is generically or generally speaking a, a good rule of thumb, a good way? To yeah. Think so of if it? you're talking SMB sales, now again, I need to have a baseline first, right? So I try to figure out what what I could do and what I know is possible and then cut it down a little bit. So for example, at Felix, let's say, uh, my, my, my second company, we had, um, we had, I was trying to get people to three sales a day, right? So the trial period, we had, uh, you need to make 40 sales in 60 days, right? So that's like, a, it's like about one and a half, uh, or, or one sale every one and a half days or something like that. And that's just like, if you can't get there, how am I going to get you up to three, right? Yeah. But it was a really nice uh, kind of like way to ste step into it. And it got really hard, right? Because your first day on the phones, uh, it's going to be hard to make – a lot of people do make sales, but it's going to be hard to make a bunch. And it's going to be hard to make a, a sale a day in your first week. So really it starts to ramp up towards the end. But I thought that was a nice thing. Like, like around 60, 90 days I think is a really good – um, barometer for hey can this person do it or, or, or can't they awesome what kind of support do you give people during that time how do you onboard train them uh, get them into the process coach them to like what does a, a week by week what does a week look like with kind of a new sales hire yeah all kinds of stuff but like if again if I'm going to bring someone into that type of environment I better know that I have everything right for them so like by that time and you're bringing in an inexperienced person you can't just say like Go ahead, figure it out, right? You, you've got to have uh, some kind of script for them that you know that that's worked. So whether you've proved that out as the founder or, you, or I've proved it out as the, the first salesperson, again, I know I can make three sales a day. I'm only asking for one, that, that type of thing. That's important. Then what I like to do a lot is just kind of like throw them to the wolves. Get them out there. The first week is really just like, learning how to get hit, right? Like learning how to take those punches. And then every once in a while, I'm trying to teach them how to like just throw a punch back, right? But it, it's, it's a lot of just like learning how to, how to hear no over and over and over again. And then, you know, I have, I have a lot of one-on-ones with them. We have a lot of uh, training sessions. I have a, uh, a five-day kind of like in the classroom, little sales 101, a little bit about the product, everything you should know before they get on the phones. And then I'm trying to do one-on-ones with them like constantly. I'm always there to like jump on the phone or, or whatever's going on. So a lot of hands-on. I'll always have at bare minimum one manager to every 10 uh, trainees and try and get more of that. Also do a lot of shadowing with current salespeople, like all, all of that. And backward shadowing, let the current salespeople listen in on their calls and suggest some things. So you really try you, – if you're going to put someone on a trial basis, you've got to know that you're giving them absolutely everything you can possibly give them for them to be successful. How do you balance that with the pressure to perform? So if I know, let's say, you know, a, a typical salesperson does whatever it is, right? 100, 150 calls to get to three sales. I know I just need to get to one, but I'm inexperienced. So I definitely still going to have to do this like 100, 150 calls. Where in the day do do I fit in the coaching, the training, the learning, all that? Is that just extra curriculum, like after the working hours, or do you just onboard them in a way where the first week they spend half the time doing and half the time learning? How do you think about that? Because that's a struggle that lots of sales teams have. Like every minute of training that's important is a minute of you not doing sales. So how do you balance that? Yeah, I guess that's an interesting question. I I don't think I'm going to give you a good answer. <laughs> I let's think explore I, I, it, let's explore it at least because yeah. I, I'm also I'm also wondering I don't also have a formula that I think is right for everything for everybody. 
You know, I, I think I've kind of been all over the place. I like to do a lot of like just on the on the job training, like as you're going, uh, make it happen. Maybe you pull into a room for 45 minutes. Like, like to be honest, you can't just make calls uh, for eight, 10 hours straight. Like you can't do that. You have to take a break. Right. And so at three o'clock, it's really nice to have a meeting every day at three o'clock, even if it's just to, to fuck around. Right. Like it's just, just good to like get off the phone, like relax a little bit. And so a lot of times we'll do that and half of it's messing around and half of it's like listening to things that go on. I like to, with trainees especially, always have kickoff meetings early in the morning. You know, some people might get in at seven and start working to try and get ahead of their numbers, but I'll get in at nine and you know, I'll, I'll try and have a kickoff meeting at nine. What did we learn before? We have a best, here at Foursquare, we have a best practices meeting uh, once a week. It's like, what's working for everyone? Share what they're doing or what you're struggling, what questions you have for the team. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, even if you're making 150 calls, you're not maxing out all your time. There's a lot in between where you're doing this, that, or the other. So let's try and make that time productive. Um, I, I guess that's my theory. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, there's one thing to, to have the perfect answers for everything, but I think it's really good to see that there's some questions where even people that a lot of people look at you and myself in many cases like sales experts and sales gurus and they come with all their problems because we had some success in the past with it. But there's some things that there's no clear answer or there's there might be one, but we also struggle with it and still balancing in trial and error. There's so, so many things that you don't just figure it out and then you just know everything and you have the perfect answers to all situations. And I think that's important for people to also know. Like there's going to be a bunch of shit that you think is wrong or where you're not sure how to do it and that's just life and you'll have to keep marching forward trying to figure it trying to find out i always say figure out but i mean find out yeah <laughs> but i'm super conscious about it now <laughs> um so so i think that's important too right uh, and, and you know i mean I'm, I'm in the same boat we're now growing a little bit the the sales team for the past, we set up all this automation, all this magic, so we didn't have that many people, but still were able to do a lot of crazy shit. But now that we have a lot more people, now some of the things we kind of neglected over the past are obvious, and we're like, oh shit, we need to care more about training and more about this and that. That was not as important uh, when you have like a super experienced, super like tight knit group team that just knows what they're doing. It's hard, um, man. Yeah. yeah, my, yeah. My, my biggest problem is that I can't do the same thing twice. So I'm here now, like, like building my, my third team. And I've abandoned like a lot of the things that I used to do before just because like I get tired of the, of the, of the same <laughs> So I see videos from like Felix and they've got like a couple or a hundred or so salespeople and they're doing all the stuff that I used to do and they're killing it and they're doing such a good job at it. And I'm, and I'm on like trying to do new things or forgetting about the stuff that I used to do. Uh, yeah, it's hard. You got to just keep, you got to just keep thinking, keep churning. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one last question is like, so we talked about like the philosophy who to look for to hire, how to onboard them, uh, how to create the right culture. Once somebody's through that initial bump, right, they do their, their testing period, they, they prove themselves that they can be part of the team. You know, how do you think about like the, the trajectory afterwards, especially in SMB? You know, um, I mean, there's people that that there's people that will look at this gig kind of as a as a in between doing something else in their life, right? They're just they're not in it for a whole career in sales. There's yeah. people that want to become the best at sales and there's people that want to grow into leadership and management. A lot of times people don't really know what they want or they think they want something out of these three options, but they might be wrong about what they think they want. In reality, yeah. that, that thing makes them unhappy. So how do you think about like developing, coaching and mentoring your sales team wants it's not like super junior anymore and how to think about like helping these people grow and you had some amazing mentors in the past it seems that really influenced you deeply and what made them really good at it and how did they approach it so maybe um just sharing some of that as kind of a final note i think is going to be super valuable yeah this one's really hard uh especially in a startup because when you're hiring your first couple of people you're not thinking about about you know two months from now, let alone two years from now, right? You're just trying to get to tomorrow. And so it's, it's really, really tough to do. The one thing I think is important too, you're in, in your first kind of sales hire, you're always gonna wanna hire like really ambitious, really entrepreneurial people, which means they better move up, you better have spaces for them to go. Um, you know, when we, what I learned from Yex and what we did at Felix was, we just said, hey, this kind of job, it's, it's uh, a year and you're up or out, 
right? Like this is going to be like a really good training ground. And it actually is, I think anyone that's done local sales at a high level or transactional sale are the best sellers out there. I see it from the guys at single platform and signpost and yaks and like all these like Yodel, all these local sales companies are now just dominating in, in larger enterprise sales here, the people that come out of it. And so that was kind of my thought, you know, a year up and out, up or out. Um, I'm going to, hopefully if there's stuff here, we'd love, we'd love to help develop you and get there. If there's not, I'm literally going to do everything I can to place you in the best possible job because I want my new guys that I'm going to hire to look and say like, Hey, we got guys working at Foursquare. We got guys that, you know, we got the CEO of Twitter that used to be one of my, uh, Felix reps, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sure that'll happen. So, so that's the, the way like we started to think about it. Um, in general, you hope that you can always, always keep your team. But if you're going to have a team of you know, 30, 40 sellers, there's only like one or two manager positions and probably only a couple of enterprise positions you have. The really important thing that I always used to do or try and do is really often talk to the rep about what they want. What do they actually want? Why are they doing this job? Do they just want to make a ton of money? And if they want to make a ton of money, why? Like, why do they want to make that money? What do they want to spend it on? How can I help them get there? Do they want to like advance their career? Do they want to learn how to build a sales team so they can one day build a sales team? Great. If I understand that and I'm having a meeting, maybe I'll like clue them in ahead of time on some of the things I'm going to say and afterwards wrap up on like why I did this or that and how I think it went well and ask them their questions and help them mentor people. If, if I think that they want to become an enterprise sales rep, I'm going to bring them in on some of my bigger calls or have them talk with some of my enterprise rep or, or do whatever I can to help them learn that. And if you can understand that, you can really help through development. I actually can't tell you how many people, uh, salespeople I've had that have come to me and said, hey, Dave, thanks so much, but I'm out of here, right? <laughs> and, and when that happens, if you're going to a great place, I'm the happiest person. I'm not, you know, I want you, but I want you to go off to a great place. And, and they've sometimes come to me and I'm like, dude, don't take that job, right? I don't think so. And they come back. And some of those people are still working for me today from Yex to Felix and now at Foursquare, right? And, and so if you can really understand what your reps want and, how they, and if you can help them to get there, it doesn't matter uh, if you have the position there or not. They're going to trust you and want to and stay with you. And if you have those positions that do open up, you're going to continue to have great reps with you all along the way and they're going to be happy, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that taking that long-term approach thinking about the team, even beyond not just the current company, but just thinking about your entire career and saying, hey, I'm up or out, or like if, if the company grows to the degree where we have tons of opportunities for everybody here to grow into higher and higher positions, awesome. If we don't, I want you to keep progressing your career because that's good for us as well. For the business, we can tell everybody, hey, here's what junior sales reps turn into you know, once they work for us and with us, yeah. but also good for you, you're building your network and eventually, you know, you, you might start a business or join another business and then hire a bunch of these other people and then they bring their teams in. It, you need to think about this for your, like building, coaching this young talent, uh, uh, you have the opportunity to create a relationship that will last for life, right? It doesn't and, always and work that real. way. And it, it's really hard to think about that when you are a kid right out of school, but you know, our, our, our CRO at Foursquare, uh, I, like mo most of the leadership team is people that he's worked with before at one company or, or another. And then he brought me in and I took three or four guys that, that used to work with me before. That's how it works. Even if they've gone to different companies in between, like if you're good, you're making good relationships. I know you're a great rep. Uh, we're going to cross paths some, somewhere down the line. Yeah. So it's important to think about. Awesome. Good shit. My man. Uh, for people that want to get in touch with you, for people that want to get more information about you from you, what's, what are all the best ways to get in touch with you? What are the best ways to be connected with you on the web or otherwise? Oh boy, not the phone. My phone's full all the time. <laughs> uh, the best thing, so, so uh, me and a, a couple of guys here that are, that are in the sales network have built um, a, a meetup and blog and everything called Building the Sales Machine uh, that, Still, he was one of our first speakers at. I loved uh, it. I loved it. The format, the format was dope. Was really fucking awesome. So I can highly recommend to everybody to go to these events and sign up and consume everything you guys do. 
Yeah, we've got buildingthesalesmachine.com going there and a lot of great, like the thought leaders somehow are wanting to be a part of it and so are, hel are helping us out. Mark Robert, the CRO of HubSpot's uh, coming for the next one. So you can follow there. Otherwise, uh, I have a sales blog, it's just my name.nyc. Uh, there's nothing good on there though. And, oh, no, uh, no, 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 there's some other, good pieces on there. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, 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 otherwise, yeah, um, Twitter, wh whatever. However you can get to me, I, I love helping and helping people kind of like build and grow teams. Hey, Dave, this was awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and being generous with it and sharing kind of your ideas and thoughts. I definitely know I appreciate it. You, you inspired some ideas and the moment we'll hang up the Skype call, I'll think of, I'm going to be scheming some new things we're going to be trying out with the team. So uh, good shit. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, and keep inspiring and crushing it and being kind of a sales, sales thought leader of the next generation as I think of you is like the non-douchey, non-like, suit and oh tie, robotic, I'm a perfect sales sleazy guy and I only care about money. No, you're real, you know, you're an awesome guy, you're charismatic, you're comfortable to be around with, but you're, tr you're doing really cutting edge shit and at the same time you're just doing the basics, right, which is caring about your team, caring about your customers, grinding, hustling, doing the hard things. So I really appreciate your work and I, I respect it tremendously. So keep, keep doing what you're doing. Hey, thanks, man. It wouldn't be one of my talks if I didn't say hard work pays off. My guys will appreciate that. <laughs> hard work pays off. That's the quote to end with. Thank you so much. That's right. See you later. Thanks, man. See you. Bye.